hello welcome thank you for coming i hope you're well this is the just bloody post-it podcast conversations of inspiration for people who are putting themselves out there on the internet if you're posting because you love what you do and you want others to know about it then this is the place to hear more about the art of marketing life and business our guest this time is remarkable. It was an honor to speak to her. And in fact, until a couple of years ago, she was the most remarkable person whose work I wasn't aware of. But what a story. Dame Stephanie Shirley. We can call her Steve. I'm a survivor. I'm also a a patriot. Uh, I uh, love this country with a a passion that uh, only somebody who has lost their human rights can feel. And so in a way, Um, My childhood has absolutely driven my personality, driven my life, continues to do so. Tech entrepreneur Stephanie Shirley came to the UK when she was five years old without her parents, a child refugee fleeing the Nazis on the kinder transport train from Vienna to London. She recovered from the trauma of her childhood to, in the 1960s, found a virtually all-female computer software company which pioneered home and flexible working. How have we not come further yet? It was ultimately valued at three billion pounds, making Dame Stephanie one of the richest women in Britain. But she spent recent years giving that money away. She's now a speaker and a philanthropist with an especially special interest in supporting autistic charities and research. Let your ears adjust to the sound of this one. We recorded it between my office and Steve's office and it's a tiny little bit echoey, but it should be absolutely fine. We chat about the source of her relentless drive, confidence, how others can find confidence about happiness. But first, I asked her why she's known as Steve. Well, my name Stephanie comes from St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna. And I'm very proud of it. I actually chose it after I got uh, British citizenship. Uh, I was born with the name of Vera. But when in business, I was writing uh, promotional letters, and they were letters long before the days of email, uh, signing them with that double feminine of Stephanie, Shirley, Shirley being my marital name, I got nobody bothered to answer them. And my dear husband suggested that I uh, use the family nickname of Steve. And so I wrote the same sort of letters to the same sort of prospects, signing them as Steve Shirley. And uh, it began to get some responses. I began to get some interviews and I had a good story to tell. So I began to get some work for the company. Um, it is incredible the the preconceptions that can come with knowing things about people before we meet them. And it's so fascinating that just by flipping your feminine to Uh, masculine it can um open some doors and i'm sure that is still the case sadly i fear Um, so yes uh, yeah yeah i fear so too Uh, uh, another thing that was remarkable about you when you set up your early businesses was that you employed women on a flexible basis can you believe that 60 years on this is still a hot topic you obviously had (laughs) real confidence at the time that that could work as an employer every time you ask women what they want from their ambience employment uh, they come up with two things family friendly uh, and flexibility and so my company started as flexible in the extreme Uh, we worked part-time, full-time, summer working. We had contracts that were zero-hour contracts, min-max contracts, consultancy contracts, summer-only contracts. Um, Really an enormous variation. We even paid people from a cafeteria benefits so that they could choose. I'd like to have more holiday. I'd like to have a better pension. uh, I'd like more day-to-day salary. And that sort of flexibility and listening to what people wanted from their employer um, attracted um, a large number of bright, intelligent, well-motivated people, largely women. And certainly of the first 300 staff we employed, 297 were women. So I really practiced what I preached, you know, and it really made a difference to taking women into the into society. 
it must have created exceptional loyalty as well, I imagine. I, I like to think so. Uh, we had a uh, reunion a couple of years ago uh, of a company that had, no longer exists, of course, because it was taken over in 2007. Uh, we had, I had dealings with uh, an ex-member of staff. Yesterday, there's an ongoing relationship with people that we work together 50, 60 years ago now. Um, but why do you think then it's still not de rigueur in, in the workplace that this is offered? And there's, st there's still a real hot debate over whether this can now work even after the pandemic. A lot of people still seem to be sceptical about whether we can trust people to get things done at home. Well, you've mentioned a very important word, and that is trust. A lot of managers are used to working with what's called presenteeism. Um, if there's somebody's there, we pay them. Whereas modern economy is based on remunerating against achievement, not against presence. And that has to really, really change. Um, the fact is that the more you trust people, the more trustworthy they become. Um, and so as we get in the habit of having to trust people, say, during lockdown, because we couldn't see them. I think as we go back, we shall go finish up with some sort of hybrid uh, activity. The crisis brings out the best in most of us most of the time. And I think this is what's happened um, during uh, lockdown. Mm, it's interesting, that sense of purposefulness and pulling together that it, it gener seemed to generate in so many businesses. And Interesting, again, how they'll take that forward. There are still very few women, such as yourself, in leadership roles in tech. We still see a lot of white men, Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey at Twitter, Bill Gates, could go on and on and on. Would the industry be different if there were more women round the table, do you think? Or do you feel it's the type of person rather than the gender of the person that I think it would be very different. Um, it, of course, the sort of people who are attracted to work in, in, in high tech uh, are, are somewhat different. Um, but uh, the female aspects of how we integrate humanity into our technology, um, that's stereotypically a, a sort of female way of looking at it. And I'm quite sure things would be different. You say that there are not many uh, people, but actually, I've known quite a few really world class women. It's perhaps that they don't have the same public profile then uh, that, that I'm I'm not so aware of them. Does that frustrate you that your profile perhaps isn't as big as uh, your peers or as big as I think it should be? Maybe you don't. I don't think it should be different at all. I find it quite embarrassing anyway. Uh, but I love the, the challenge of, of rising to uh, people's expectations. Uh, I don't feel I'm anything particularly special. Uh, I just know that I am focused. I have worked now for, uh, I started work at 18, I'm now 87, so do the arithmetic, you know, a long time. I enjoy it, I don't complain. I love my work and I continue to do it. And if I get uh, recognition for it, it's very pleasant, but no more than that. I would be really interested to hear what you think about social media, Dame Stephanie. This culture of online sharing wasn't something that was around when you were building your business. Do you see it as a positive thing or, or negative? Well, Helen, I'm certainly a three quarters glass full sort of person. I will always see the positive. But of course, now comes the time for my confession. I really don't know very much about it. I know that you have a wonderful lady that works with you called Indeed Lynn. Indeed, I do. You do. And Lynn, uh, you know, operates your Instagram profile for you. So presumably you can see the benefit of marketing your personal brand. Or is that something that other people have persuaded you to do? I think it's come from outside, really. A lot of the things are great fun, but uh, it's not something that is high on my list of priorities. I'm always focused on innovation, of ideas, uh, of thinking about the world in different ways, of entrepreneurism. I've started not only my company, but many, many projects for charities, two not-for-profit uh, organisations, all of which are, have 
have taken to sustainability, by which I mean that they run without my input and without my financial support. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. So that's really what, 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 what I like to do. In order to grow these successful businesses and ventures, you must have learnt something about the art of persuasion and spreading your ideas, which is what we do in marketing as well. How do you bring somebody on board with something new, a new idea that you've got? How do you persuade? I think I'm quite naive about this. If I believe in something, I will bore you silly talking about it. Uh, but you will also gather, get from me the authenticity uh, of my brand, shall we say. You, you will get from me the enthusiasm, the fact that it's been professionally analysed, that it's been uh, evaluated, uh, that this is good and worth trying. A lot of new ideas fail, a lot of new businesses fail, uh, and we have to, that's the sort of resilience that entrepreneurs have to deal with these continual ups and downs and so on. But my selling is, is, is more a question of showing people what I get from something, how exciting this is, wouldn't it be lovely? If I'm fundraising, for example, I never actually ask, and that's against all the um, advice that I've had, I wait until people can say, how can I help? And uh, that seems to come fairly naturally. Fascinating. Never ask, but just show people. Yeah, I, I'm not yeah. sure that that's a, a good thing because everybody says if you don't <laughs> ask, you don't get. But I don't ask. I have a lot of energy and people do trust me. And uh, in marketing, you've, you, you've just got to trust the vendor, the, the supplier. Is it your positivity, your, your natural positivity that allows you to bravely try out all of these ideas in your career? No, I don't think it is by nature. We haven't spoken about my childhood, but I was an unaccompanied child refugee who arrived in England at the age of five, and I was pretty traumatised. Um, and I was fostered by a love, lovely, loving couple uh, in the Midlands. That took a bit of recovering from pretty early on, when I was five, six, seven, eight, I just began to realise that I desperately needed to justify that my life had been saved from Nazi Europe, uh, where so many others died, including a million children at that time. And that has driven my life. It means that I could cope with change because I dealt with that change. I did deal with it. New language, new food, new parents, new nationality, new everything. Having dealt with that, nothing much throws me anymore, Helen. It's not as bad as my childhood. And I've also lost our only child. Nothing much can uh, match the horror of that. Um, so I have that resilience that no, I, knowing I have coped with, with pretty bad things in the past. I'm a survivor. I'm also a, a patriot. Uh, I uh, love this country with a, a passion that uh, only someone who has lost their human rights can feel. And so in a way, um, my childhood has absolutely driven my personality, driven my life, continues to do so. And if that answers your question, that's where the resilience comes from. It does. It's incredibly moving to hear the way you speak about it. And it continues to drive you today, aged 87. Dame Stephanie, you could really be forgiven for putting your feet up at this point. Have you any plans to, or you, you, you continue to keep moving and working and doing what you can? I like to do new things. Uh, I try to still act as a role model for women. When I was working in Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, it was clear that I had to operate as an honorary man, they called me. Um, and uh, although I covered my head uh, in the traditional uh, way, acceptable way there, uh, I knew that I had to show that women could do public speaking. I was talking to a lot of hospitals at the time. But yes, uh, I, I intend to go on. 
it's a very specific set of circumstances that drives you forward. How do you use what you've learned from that to help other women come out of themselves and put themselves out there, if you like, put their hand up, say their idea and make things happen? I suppose it's by talking about taking a chance, trying it. If it doesn't work, you can always try something else. And that's the scientific method. If something works, I do more of it. Uh, If it doesn't work, I'll try something else. Not everything is a success. It's light and shadow. The pleasure comes from making something that's not predetermined to actually making it happen and feeling in whatever way I was part of making that happen. That's my um, contribution to the world. And uh, that sort of drive to, to, to give it a go uh, means that uh, you, you need to train yourself, you need to put the energy and the time in, um, but then you can enjoy work. Work is not just something to do when you'd rather be doing something else. Could you say what you feel most proud of in your career, either success or failure? I'm certainly not proud of my failures, but I, I have <laughs> but made we learn, many. We learn from them. Uh, we learn from them and <laughs> learn a great deal from them. And I try always to make new mistakes so that I don't repeat myself. I think in the commercial world, it was definitely taking my company into co-ownership. Uh, a quarter of the company finished up in the hands of the staff at no cost to anyone but me. Uh, and I'm very, very proud of that. I wanted to do very much more. I wanted to get it to 100%. I was inspired by the John Dewey's partnership. Uh, but I, I, I failed in that. But I did get it to 24%. And that was 62% control, 24% ownership, and 62% control. That was a, a, a very complex uh, system of voting we had. From the charity point of view, and my life today is philanthropic, i making social investments, giving away uh, the money that I made in business. I think my happiest one, not that I'm so proud of it, but the happiest one is a school uh, prize court that I set up for children with autism. My late son was autistic, which is why I do a lot for autism. Um, And every time I go there, it really gives me a good feel. The one I'm most proud of is a medical research charity, Autistica. And that's the one that I fundraise for now. All my speeches, book sales, all go to Autistica uh, because that's doing extremely valuable strategic work that really makes a difference to people with autism being able to lead long, healthy and happy lives. In the long run, that's the one that will make more difference than a school, however wonderful it is. You're clearly unconcerned with the accumulation of of wealth. If money doesn't make us happy, you've led such a a long and productive life. What do you feel are the the keys to being content, I suppose? What really makes people happy, I think, is relationships, surely. If I love and am loved, I am a very happy person, as I am these days. Without those human relations, uh, I think we are existing rather than living. You talk about relationships and networking. Did you always invest a lot of time in business relationships and and networking? And I guess what we do now is social networking. Do you hold much stall in that? I think business relationships are absolutely vital. I don't think you can get into partnership with organisations or turn them into customers, yet alone permanent, you know, ongoing customers with doing, giving repeat business uh, without really good, firm relationships. And relationships take, take time to build up. It's not like speed dating. You know, you really have to um, have, and have that mutual trust so that you could work together in the spirit of goodwill when things are the hiccup, something goes wrong. It doesn't matter. You have a partnership. You sort it out. Um, So I think entirely in business, relationships are of prime importance. You know, what what makes things happen? Time, skills, tools. And I think the most important is motivation. That doesn't seem to vary whether it's a for-profit organisation or a charity. It was easy. We'd all be millionaires, but we wouldn't appreciate it. 
<laughs> You're a very artful speaker. I'd love some tips from you for people who have trouble with public speaking in whatever forum that is, whether it's in front of their boss or in front of people on the internet or in a room full of people. A lot of it for me comes from sheer authenticity. Some of it comes from preparation. If I'm not prepared for something, I know I'm not happy. And so I do always put that in. But the prime thing that I'm trying to do is get a clear message and then a few great stories, perhaps a few jokes. Uh, but, you know, it's very simple, a message and some stories that people will remember. It is quite simple, wherever you're doing it, whatever forum. How have you enjoyed doing Zoom speaking, Dame Stephanie? Because I, I know that's how you've had to sort of move, move your speaking work in the past year or so. Well, it, it's given me an international audience because I don't travel intercontinentally anymore. Um, and so last year I spoke to Chile, I spoke to Southern Australia, I spoke to India. You know, these exciting things just to feel that your ideas, that your relationships are spreading out. Anybody who wanted to learn more about your life, your incredible life in detail, can buy your book, Let It Go. And what's, what's in the title, Let It Go? It comes from a Buddhist principle of not letting the rancor of the past spoil the present or the future. Um, and I felt I needed to learn to let it go, um, to forget my refugee start uh, and become a happy person. Uh, I also learned to let my money go. Uh, and I've had more pleasure in learning to give it away wisely um, than I had in making it, and, and, I, and I, I enjoyed those years as well. It's almost a, a, a sort of lifestyle, let it go. It's not a question of amateurism, just that it doesn't matter, but let it go, move on, try something else. We always have to let that go and move on. And I've learned that the hard way. Uh, when I stopped leaving my own company, that was a big transition. I had to learn to let it go. You said that you had to decide to let your refugee past go so that and choose to, to be happy. I was just wondering whether you felt that you had to make that conscious decision at different points in your life. I had a lot of mental health problems. So I had six years of analysis at a very good Tavistock clinic in London um, to help me get through the trauma of the past. And they did succeed. And I am now a happy person. And I put that down to that treatment that the National Health Service uh, gave me for free, all amazingly, uh, when I was 20 or something like that. And I felt I wasn't fit to, to marry uh, until I had finished that treatment. As I must have started at 19 because I married at 26. I always move on to the next thing. And during lockdown, uh, what could I do? Yeah, I couldn't go out. I, um, and I decided to put together another book called So to Speak, which is an anthology of um, a selection of my speeches over the past 40 years. So some of them are quite historic interest. Um, some of them are um, classics that you could give them in 50 years' time. They're just about people. Um, and that is uh, being published, self-published. That was enormous fun, Helen, to learn to self-publish, dealing with the publishers, thinking about what sort of cover do we want? What, what are the end papers? What, what, how are we going to have the layout? We had a super designer. We commissioned a company called Deep, whose work I had admired uh, in some stuff that Google did. Um, and uh, so that is a, a, a wonderful it's a coffee table book, I suppose. You'd never read it from start to finish, but you'd have it lying about and pick it up if you want inspiration. Lovely gift to give to a thoughtful friends or business associates. Yeah, sounds wonderful. And I, I do I love the the the, the world of self publishing and, and how it's so freeing and open and the barriers are taken away. You don't need anybody's permission yeah. in order to put out into the world what you wish to put out. Just before we go, are we allowed to talk about the fact that Let It Go is being made into a, a film? Well, sadly, with the pandemic put uh, paid to that, but rather more excitingly, uh, we're working with uh, the development partnership 
on a mini series, which would, you know, allow time to tell the whole story of my refugee start and business and autism, my late son, uh, and philanthropy, um, and, and, and to, to go for one of these streaming services, you know, Netflix or, or Apple. Um, and so we're very excited about that, waiting to hear. I think we've got a meeting in September to see how that has gone. To get it out at that level would give me a great deal of satisfaction. I can't think of a, a more a more worthy story. Dame Stephanie, I'll wrap it up there. I'm so very, very grateful for your time and generosity in telling your story to us today. Been a pleasure talking, Helen. You can read all about Dame Stephanie Shirley's life in her autobiography, Let It Go. There's a link in the show notes, highly recommended, and it's going to be on TV before long. I'm absolutely sure of that. We can't all be like Steve. We haven't experienced what she did, but we can do something brilliant that she does so well, and that's listen to the people that we work with, whether it's colleagues or clients or people in our audience. Really listen to what they want and trust them. And perhaps we can just channel a bit more of her seize the day spirit. I am inspired too. Okay, subscribe wherever you're listening so that you don't miss the next episode of Just Bloody Post It. Check out the Post It notes too. They're weekly mini podcasts on marketing topics that I've been thinking about. The last episode was about own boss life and the one before that video on Instagram. Let me know what you think. Thank you always for listening. I'll be back soon. Cheerio.